I heard you've been spending a lot of time at your auntie's house. How's the couch life? Got my woman and my baby living there. It's hard, man. But you know, everybody can't do what you do. Really, what I do getting played out, Dre. Where the money at? And why you got to be so ruthless, cuz? I'll make a few changes. Where you think you going? I'm just trying to get home. That's my son. You need to get back in the house, or I will ruin your night. I got to talk to my moms like that. You had the chance to change the situation. Would you take it? Just hit that first beat hard, all right? You cruising down the street. All right. Cruising down the street in my 6 foot. Hey, that was dope, eh? You're listening to Compton's very own Ice Cube, Easy e and Dr. Dre. I got to tell you, you are witnessing history. People are scared of you guys. You have a unique voice. The world needs to hear it. They want N.W.A.? Let's give them N.W.A. This is only the tip of the iceberg, gentlemen. What's going on? What do you have in that bag? Are you kidding me? You can't take that in the bus. Your songs glamorize gangs and drugs. Our art is a reflection of our reality. You guys supposed to be somewhere? These are artists. Rap is not an art. You cannot come down here and harass my clients because of what they look like. I promise you, things are gonna be different from here on out. Listen, to be honest with you, I don't know anything about hip hop, but I know that you're special. You want to be involved with this gangster life? Here we go. Speak a little truth and people lose their mind. This isn't the Crypt and Bloods. This is a threat from the federal government. They're trying to tell us what we can't play. This is NWA. Yo, Dre. What up? I got something to say. We can keep going, man. We can take over the goddamn world. Hello everyone, welcome to a very special episode of Louder Pop Culture Podcast. This is our special review episode on the movie Straight Outta Compton. Uh, I am your host, Tom Ye West, and joining me is my co-host, as always, Alanis Maximus. How are you, Alan? Yeah, not too bad, and yourself? Yeah, not too bad, bro. Uh, how's your uh, New Year's started? Good? Yeah, yeah. So far, so good. <laughs> nice one, nice. So, um, yeah, uh, we basically watched this movie uh, together yesterday. Um, we've also, I've also seen it many times before. I saw it at a special advanced screenings when it was released in theaters. Um, it's the first time I've ever actually gone to special advanced screenings. I usually just wait for the actual day. So, um, yeah, and we're just going to get stuck straight into it. I'll give you a few little... Uh, t- uh, Tidbits from it. Uh, this movie is directed by F. Gary Gray, who is also the director from the movie Friday and I believe Fast and the Furious 8. Um, this movie has a runtime of 2 hours and 27 minutes and it is rated R. It was also released in the year 2015. Um, 2 hours and 27 minutes is a decent chunk of time, um, but it does go very quickly, I believe. Um, and, yeah, this movie also stars O'Shea Jackson Jr., Ice Cube's son, uh, playing Ice Cube, Corey Hawkins, uh, who actually plays Dr. Dre, and Jason Mitchell, who plays Easy e along with uh, Paul Giamatti, who plays Jerry Heller. Um, so, before we get into a few little things, I um, sort of want to get your feel on what you thought of the movie and how, your, how you feel about it now, how you feel about the movie and that sort of era and culture um, after watching the movie? Uh, I feel... I, um, I first saw part of it about a year ago and meant to see it again. And after re-watching it the other day, I'm really glad that I finally got around to watching it. And when doing this, I kind of had the foot up the ass to do so because it's really bloody good. Um, it sets the tone really well. Like, it... it feels legitimately like it's being shot in the 80s almost. Like, it's just the style, the, um, I guess, social climate, 
how everyone looks and acts is just pretty much on point for the late eighties, early nineties. It's really captured it well. Definitely. And um, uh, what was like you know what what I know you're like you know not really into the rap and hip hop side of music as you know much as I probably am, um, but. I mean, has this made you more interested in learning about them as a group or listening to their stuff a little bit more or anything like that? Or has it swayed you a little bit that way? Um, I've always been kind of a bit of a fan. Like, I haven't listened to heaps of NWA. Like, here and there, I've listened to kind of uh, some songs and, and some Ice Cube, but I'm definitely interested in maybe going back and listening to more of their, their albums as a whole. And things like that now. Um, yeah, well, there's not much. Got me a bit more curious. There's not many. There's not many albums to pick from, to be honest. Um, they did Straight Outta Compton. Then they did. Yeah. <laughs> um, then they did. I'm not going to say the name of the album because I'm, I can't say that word. But um, they did their second album. Uh, some and, and something for life. Um, it's actually backwards though. Um, I can't remember how you say it backwards on the album, but um. Yeah, there's not a lot to pick from. Uh, Easy E's kind of got a little bit, you know, that he did on his own um, before, during, and after Straight Outta Compton, uh, before NWA. Um, so he's got a bit of a back catalogue, and NWA have a sort of, you know, decent catalogue. Um, and they actually released two songs in, I'd say, 93 or something like on maybe a bit later. It was once Easy E had died, so maybe 94, 95. Um, and it was just two songs, Chin Check and Hello, and I love both those songs. They're really good. I actually think that was like, if we if NWA kept going, those are the songs like we, we could expect for a whole album, you know what I mean? A much updated, sort of polished, more West Coast, uh, like, you know, mid-90s, early 2000s rap more than it was the 80s sound. Um, but, yeah, like, what... What, how, what's your overall feeling on this movie? Uh, was there anything you really, really loved? Or was there anything you really hated? Um, yeah, kind of expand a little bit on that if you want. Uh, I wouldn't say there's too much I dislike. I think some of the casting was a bit weird. Like, unless it was pointed out, I never in a million years would have picked Snoop Dogg. Like, it just, to me, didn't look like him. I thought um, so. But I thought for the most part, it was really well done. Like, um, even looking back, it's got... Um, like the little cameos and stuff, like in one of the studio scenes, I uh, looked it up afterwards, but I noticed while watching there was someone wearing a public enemy hoodie or jacket. And I went back and looked and it was actually a, a cameo of uh, someone playing Chuck D. And um, most of the casting as well, like, is just amazing. Like, obviously, Ice Cube's going to look good because it was his son, so they're going to look similar. But um, Tupac and, and Easy E, there's really well cast I think uh, really good acting as well like uh, the scene where Easy is in hospital and he's just found out that he's got at most six months to live it's really believable it's intense as well just this kind of reaction and yeah I found myself um, even though I've seen the movie multiple times when you watch it in full again and you like forget about the sort of um, how serious some moments are and sad moments are like even when we were watching it I was like feeling sad, you know what I mean? Watching those parts, you know? Yeah. Um, I think they did a really good job of capturing it. It's actually um, one of the few movies I actually have physically on Blu-ray. So, um, yeah. Um, I'd, I'd say that, man, like, we will we'll, we'll definitely give our, like, you know, verdict, complete verdict at the end. That's kind of what we'll say for the end. But um, I rate this movie a lot, man. Like, I would say out of the music biopics. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this movie is the example of how you do it. Um, the Tupac one, All Eyes On Me, was very cheap. I felt like I had a low budget. I've heard bad things. I actually didn't see it because I was so disappointed at how people made it sound. So I just never watched it. I never watched the one on Biggie, Notorious. Um, but, I mean, 8 Mile wasn't a biopic, really. It was... An Eminem based based on Eminem movie, but it was not his life. Blah blah blah. You know what I mean? Like, as it, it, yeah. it's not like it was real life taken to uh, the, the the screen with um, you know 
actual fact um, and how things went down. Like, Eight Miles more of just a rap battle movie. So, I mean, I would put this at the top, uh, along with um, <clears throat> The Dirt from Motley Crue. Did it really well. Yeah. That was a great movie. Um, but I still do feel like the budget and the sort of sleekness of Straight Outta Compton is still more prevalent than in The Dirt even. I still feel like The Dirt is a Netflix movie, not a theatre movie. No. Yeah. If that makes sense. Um, but yeah, I mean, we'll get into some trivia quickly before we uh, talk a little bit more about it. Um, the actors re-recorded NWA's entire Straight Outta Compton album with producer Harvey Mason Jr. to help them get into character, which is pretty insane. Um, I don't know if you know this, but majority of the parts where it's Ice Cube's son rapping, he isn't miming. That's actually, That's actually him. him. So he oh. um, sounds a lot like his dad. Um, and, you know, for the first five times I probably saw this movie, because I've seen it a lot, I never actually picked up on that it was not mimed because... Um, I'll bring it up in this review. There is a extended section of where they play Dope Man in the club, and he's uh, doing Ice Cube's part, obviously. And then Easy E, you can hear the change in microphones, and you can hear the actual actor doing the rapping. And it's very, very easy to tell. I don't know why it was taken out of the movie because it's only a very small snippet. Um, of him, like, added into that scene. But, um, yeah. yeah, like, so he, they all, you know, really put in the work. Um, Dr. Dre actually taught his, uh, Corey, I believe his name is, um, how to spin records, scratch records, and with that scene at the start of the movie where he's scratching the records in the bedroom, that was real. <laughs> so he had to really put in the work and learn with Dr. Dre. I feel like he learned his mannerisms really well, like... I, if you know Dr. Dre interviews, if you've seen him, um, by the way, this is a side note. There's a great documentary on Netflix called The Defiant Ones. Now, that whole documentary is Dre about Dre and Jimmy Iovine, and it's a four-part series. So it tells you everything. It goes into Easy A, it goes into uh, NWA, it goes into more than that. It goes into Tom Petty, uh, Gwen Stefani, because you know uh, Jimmy Iovine, who is head of Interscope Records, um, and gave Dre the chance to start the label Aftermath and all that and partnered with him for the Beats headphones, is like the king in music as a manager, producer, uh, you know, um, company CEO. He's the king. Um, and, yeah, that documentary is available to watch. So if you've watched that documentary or if you've seen Dre, or st as much as I have in stuff, you'd understand how much that actor got down that role like it's unbelievable how much you could convince me that that was Dre younger you know what I mean so um yeah was there any parts that really um like surprised you or stuck with you from the movie that you didn't know maybe um I think a bit of the background like how kind of I guess where they all kind of came from is people I never really looked into. Um, as well as some of the stuff like uh, uh, them getting arrested out the front of the studio when they're trying to record, I think, straight out of Compton, the first EP. Yeah. And then uh, also the scene where Ice Cube's smashing up the record exec studio and then it's like, you watch it and part of you thinks, nah, nah, made up. But then you really think about it and it's like, no, nah, I, I, that's believable that that's happened. It's like, yeah, so, well, um there's actually interviews with Ice Cube. I was watching one the other day where he talks about smashing up priority records with the baseball bat because yeah. they asked him if it was true. And he said every bit of that's exactly factual how it happened. So um, <laughs> there are parts in this that aren't factual. There are parts that are acted out. But, um, like, for instance, Easy E was a uh, – what, what do you call it? Um, was a Coke dealer, but a crack, you know, a crack dealer. And um, he did deal like the way he did at the start of the movie. He went into houses like that. He went into situations like that. He stood his ground. But, I mean, that whole scene wouldn't, would have been like an amalgamation of what happens in the hood and what Easy e did. But, like, the cops, he never, apparently he never experienced getting the batarang 
Batarang or whatever it's called through the doors and stuff like that. But they need, they wanted to show that that was something that happened in Compton at crack houses and Easy E was one of the crack dealers in the hood. So they kind of wrote that scene around facts, but that scene isn't like how actually something played out for him in real life. You know what I mean? So yeah, yeah. Um, there's also a lot of uh, misinformation about how Suge actually made him hand over the contracts because there's people that say that they, he didn't get bashed. Um, he went into a room and it was just him and Suge at a desk, like arguing it out. There was also other people that said, no, we shut the door and let people take care of it. So that could be changed. Um, but majority of it has a lot of, um, has a lot of real facts in it. it has, you know, it wasn't too blown out of proportion. Um, everything that we saw happen basically happened in some form or did happen. So I think it was really good. Um, I think that uh, the standout moments for me in this movie would be the opening scene. Um, I love that scene. It's just so good. Uh, I really love, obviously I love the city of Compton's feel, vibe, tone, um, dark nature. Um, it just has a feel to that place. Like, I don't know, it's hard to explain that it's a, such a pretty looking place from like a sky view and it's got like palm trees all down the streets and everything and <laughs> all nice and then you get to ground and it's like, not that the houses look bad or anything, I'm not saying that, but it just has that Compton vibe where there's nowhere else in the planet that looks and feels the way that location and setting does and I really think that that helps the movie in its strength, obviously, because it is a movie about a, uh, NWA being and a day called Straight Out of Compton, it's obviously going to be a role in it. But I'm glad how prevalent that was in the movie. It was always, we're from Compton. This is about Compton. We're putting Compton on the map. You know, it was, it was a really cool. It's kind of like Batman for me, where I really love Gotham City, as yeah. a as a character on its own. You know what I mean? So absolutely. And Batman's not in Gotham city. Like if Batman was, uh, for instance, I hate any animated episode of Batman where he is with the justice league on a planet of green lantern fighting one of the, I don't care. You know what I mean? Like go back to Gotham city and fight Joker, you know? So <laughs> I'm, glad that, I'm glad that Compton was so prevalent. Um, and I just think, yeah, I just think there's very little to dislike about this movie. So we'll go into it's, a um, I, yeah, yeah. I agree one hundred percent. It's um, it's um, uh, it's one of those ones as well. You mentioned it being two hours and twenty minutes long, but it doesn't feel like it. Like you, it really kind of sucks you in and keeps you held there. There's no, there's no kind of dull moment where you kind of go, oh, uh, how long, much longer has this got to go? It's like, yeah, um, and I really like how they went with actors that were nobodies, like no name actors. So I didn't, I'm so glad they didn't just get, you know, whoever, like Kevin Hart, the biggest African American comedy star or the biggest African American uh, action star. I'm glad that they picked a no name cast that had done basically nothing of significance so that you didn't have a spoiled sort of view on that person. Like I, when you went into the movie, you felt like you were watching the real NWA and no, but not actors, you know, if you would have yeah. gotten there and known every actor, it would have just been like, Oh, you know, like I think Paul Giamatti was the biggest actor in that movie by far. Yeah. Um, most well-known, most established. So I think the cast choice, I agree with you was awesome. Even though uh, Paul Giamatti, I didn't pick him. Like it was most of the movie. I'm watching it going, it's familiar. Who is it? And then like towards the very end, I was like, Shit, that's Paul Giamatti. It's, yeah, um, dude, he does such a good job in that role as well. Um, yeah. Because I've watched so many docos, man, on NWA, Easy E, Ruthless Records. Even when you watch documentaries on, say, like Tupac, that always comes into it because that was around the same time, the same era, it's all connected. Dre is connected to every single thing. So, like, no matter what rock, rap documentary you watch from um, the Los Angeles area, the West Coast area, when it's around that area, that time, there's always going to be a reference to those people. So, um, yeah, dude, I just think it was, 
it was a great movie. Like I remember leaving the cinema the first time I watched it and I was just like, man, that was so fucking good. Like it was just awesome. Um, what did you think about the fact that Easy E was not a rapper? He couldn't rap and he had to do every recording in bit, like every line at the start separately. Like, so 64 lines I had to punch in or some shit separate. <laughs> I had no idea, and I think they it was hilarious how they showed it as well. Like it, it was one of those like lighter moments of the movie. It was pretty funny to watch, but I, I actually had no idea that he didn't enter into NWA as not a rapper. So that's it's actually the part that's there. playing behind me right now, which is a good coincidence. <laughs> Coincidental. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I thought it was funny. I like when uh, they laugh and Ice Cube uh, character says that. Uh, uh, that ain't it. And then he's like, Cube, you got to go. You got to get the fuck out of here. And he goes, all right, get out of here, yeller. And he's like, no, you too. And he's like, me? I got to go? You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Write the song, Cube. Shut the fuck up, Cube. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and yeah, I just, um, I have a lot of respect for them because of what they did, what they pioneered, how dedicated they were, and kind of, the way they stood up to the industry, the world, the the press, the politicians, and the police, you know? Like, I just think that they really did something special that will never be replicated again. Um, Definitely. And I just believe that they paved the way for what gangster rap is today. Um, you, I mean, yeah, you could technically say Ice-T was before him, before them and stuff, but we're talking about an impact here, and I just don't believe that Ice-T has... Personally, I don't feel like he's had that impact like NWA has made, you know. Um, but we'll get into a couple of little more trivia facts here, which is um, the letter that the FBI sent to NWA can actually now be seen at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Cleveland, Ohio. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, it says, when Ice Cube is complaining to Brian about not yet having received his money, he exclaims that he has a baby on the way. Cube was in fact talking about O'Shea Jackson, who was born in 1991, meaning o O'Shea Jr. was talking about himself during this scene. <laughs> um, the actual scratching when Dre is on the turntables was done by DJ Jazzy Jeff. Um, so yeah, like that... He must have... Okay, so he must have learnt how to do it, but then, like, the actual produ production for the movie's audio was done, like, tightened by a proper person, you know what I mean? Um, yeah, yeah. Then it says, uh, Easy e and MC Rem were the only members of NWA who belonged to a street gang. They were both members of the Kelly Park Compton Crips, a Crip sect in the Kelly Park neighborhood of Compton. They were friends long before NWA was formed and they gangbanged and sold drugs together before venturing into music. Um, the movie inspired Dr. Dre to secretly record his first album in 16 years, set to release on August 7, 2015. The album's name is Compton, a soundtrack, and he tweeted that it is his grand finale, which is a really underrated album. Uh, nobody gave it a, shot, a shot, but there was some confusion about that album, and I think that that's maybe what was led to its downfall. As you just heard, he named it Compton, a soundtrack. It came out the same month as the movie. Now, most people thought that that meant this was the soundtrack to the Straight Out of Compton movie, not <laughs> not a soundtrack which he named it that because he said he made it for the city of Compton so it's a soundtrack to the city of Compton itself um so if anyone hasn't heard it and got confused by that because I remember when it was coming out and I was really excited and I kind of got I understood what was happening and I was talking about it and there were people like it's just a soundtrack to the movie I'm like no it's not man um, <laughs> So if you haven't checked that out, go check it out because it's really fucking good. And the other thing I'll quickly say about that is he actually had a brain aneurysm at the end of last year, Dr. Dre. Um, pretty serious one too. And he had said that he wasn't going to do music anymore. He said he was done. He was retired. That was his grand finale. And since the brain aneurysm, he has now released the contract uh, for GTA and apparently is working on well, he was apparently working on an album called Detox for 15 years, and he decided to scrap it. 
and then did the Compton album instead. And it took him like eight months and he said he loved it way more than anything he did in that 15 years. So that never came out. And now that he's got a second chance at life, I think he's planning on doing Detox and it's called Detox 2. Um, he's recording at the moment. He's also going to be uh, the halftime show for the Super Bowl next year. It's Dr. Dre, Eminem, Kendrick Lamar, um, Mary J. Blige. So it's Eminem, it's Snoop Dogg, it's everyone at that halftime show. Um, and I'm not a football fan. I'm not a pigskin fan. I'm not a sports fan. So you know what? This is the most excited I've been about a Super Bowl ever, and it's not about the game. It's about the halftime show because... It's definitely a better option than Maroon 5, whoever we saw a couple of years ago. So. Oh, dude. <laughs> it's about time they picked something good. And yes. we, know that, we know that Dr. Dr... It's going to be, you know, what, a 15, 20-minute show. So what I think it's going to be is a medley. So it'll be Dr. Dre, Eminem, Kendrick, Snoop. And I think it'll be Dr. Dre and Snoop doing Ain't Nothing But A G Thing, uh, Still Dre... Then it'll go to Eminem doing Forget Forgot About Dre with Dre. And then there'll be, you know what I mean? It'll be all, because yes. he's done songs with Mary J. Blige too. So I feel like to fit all those people in and make it make sense as a halftime show, it's going to have to be sort of a medley where they come out. But Dr. Dre is on stage the entire time. You know what I mean? So that's awesome that he's coming back because he has actually named that day Dr. Dre Day as he will be releasing other news as well. Um, and Eminem said he's going to be there with a uh, bootstrap ready for Dr. Dre day. So, um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, I mean, let's get into some of the uh, details about the movie. Like, what did you think about, uh, did you actually quickly, one other thing, did you notice that when the guy comes looking for his girlfriend, Felicia in the hotel and then they push her out and ice cube says, bye Felicia. Do you remember? On yes. Friday? On yes, Friday, yes. That's from that, that's a reference to that. And did, I thought it was really cool. So had a, showed him writing the script to it. It was a bit yeah. lame. It was a bit lame the way he was like reading it out loud. That was probably a bit too much where he's like, you got knocked the fuck out. And he's like, <laughs> like, I don't think it needed to do that. It could have just showed like a screen of like, you know, Friday script and him writing and then pan out, like, zoom out. <laughs> you didn't really have to do that. But I get what they were doing with that, you know? Um, so how aware were you of like the situations that surrounded this group, like, how aware were you that, like, it started off as EZE being the artist, NWA, which, this is a weird thing for me with this movie, where I don't feel like, I feel like there should have been an explanation to why, how NWA was formed after EZE's success, because, yeah, I know that Dre produced it, and they were all working together in the studio and that, but, like, EZE was the name, the face, it's EZE's, you know, song, uh, Boys in the Hood and all that song, uh, all that stuff, but then, the next idea that you get of NWA being even a thing is when they're walking into the skate rink to do their show and it shows the poster where it says EZE and mm. NWA. Um, so I feel like that's sort of a jump that they could have really easily addressed by just having a conversation where like, we're a super group now, blah, 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 blah. Um, we'll, we'll come back to you. Let's all take this because I don't know if you remember at the start of the movie, uh, they ice cube, is it already in another group with a guy named Jinx? And yeah. that's why he couldn't do the rap on the CD. Um, and Easy E had to do it. And that's why he wrote the lyrics. And he's like, I can't. I'm in a group already. Jinx will trip on me and all that stuff. So I don't understand because it doesn't really show why he changed his mind. It doesn't really show how they came to that discussion of. Like, I know it shows what does NWA stand for. But again, this is like way after. The, album, the record's already done well. Um, so I just wish they would have kind of gotten more into that, how that came about. Um, but, yeah, how like aware of you with that Easy e was like the face and then it was NWA and then the, just sort of the breakup and then all that sort of thing? I was pretty pretty um, oblivious to it all. Like, I, I didn't know heaps of their background. Like, I didn't even know that Ice Cube left and they continued on for a little bit. Like I knew, obviously... Eventually, they broke up and you had Dre doing a solo thing and Ice Cube doing a solo thing, but never really knew how it went down. So I found it interesting to kind of learn all that through the movie as well, um, especially the politics behind it all with Jerry and and some of the dodgy transactions and things going on there and the checks bouncing. And, yeah, and well, it's very sad, man, because um, 
once Easy died, like no one knows what really happened with the 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 lawyers, like you know the will that he wrote because what happened was he had, I think he has nineteen kids, which is a, which is a lot. <laughs> might not be that much i'll have a quick look so because i don't want to you know just sound like i'm embellishing i'll just have a quick look he has a lot of children yeah um easy a children he has 11 children yeah so that's a lot of kids and he loved his kids more than life itself and when he died he left every single one of them out of the will except his wife at that time tamika who now owns his entire state and estate. And if you see it the, in the movie, she's credited to Mika as being one of the like main people. And that's because she owns everything and she refuses to give anything to his kids. So what's confusing is they did the drafting up of the will when he was in a hospital bed dying basically. And they don't know if he was, kind of forced or if he chose that decision or whatever, but apparently his kids feel very burned by it. And that's kind of a sad thing that he left such a legacy for us and everyone else and music wise and made such an impact and seemed like such a awesome, smart guy when he got into it. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. So it's a shame that his kids are the ones that suffer the most from his loss, I guess more than anything, because you know, um, it's just sad that the mother would do that as well because they're not, you know, not every kid is from her. So yeah. it's just sad that that's the kind of the circumstances, you know. Um, and it's also really sad that we never actually got to see that reunion that they were intending to do, you know. Yeah, it was um, tragically anticlimactic, I think. Like they were about to like kind of reform and then he collapses and... Yeah, it was, is it so? That was actually how it happened. Like they were kind of on the brink of that when he actually did. They were just diagnosed. talking about it, and that's a true fact too. That Ice Cube went there, and that was the first time he'd seen Dre in ages, and everything. And he, they, Ice Cube refused to go in the room because he wasn't communicating and it was unconscious. And he said he just couldn't go in and look at him like that. He needed to <laughs> talk to him, and if he couldn't talk to him, he was going to have to leave it at what their last interaction was, and that was when they met up at that club. And spoke and hugged it out. So he thought that was the best way to kind of let it go, you know. Um, it's very sad. Um, I think that they, I think that I think that one of the main characters in it, DJ Yeller, um, I think he's awesome. I think he's funny. He's, he's parts, but I think he's very left out of the movie. Um, he's very small compared to the rest of the cast. The fact is, yeah, it's a, it's a fact too because the actual guy, uh, DJ Yeller, in real life. Um, asked for more money when they said what they were offering him for his portrayal in the movie. And he asked for more money and they said, listen, you don't need, we don't need you. Like, we can do this movie without DJ Yeller in it. And I feel like they kind of did that nearly anyway with that actor. But I do feel like <laughs> he did have a standout moment, which was when he's in the hospital with EZE and he's like, you want to listen to the tape of Bone Thugs and Harmony? Like, the, the grab oh, yeah. Something. and he's like I'll leave it here and he's crying and stuff and I thought that he killed that part you know like that makes you really feel something you know um, and um, yeah I just feel like they all did such a fantastic job man I just can't I can't recommend this movie enough for the cast the soundtrack the vibe the feel especially if it's something if it's sort of the topic or subject you're really passionate about too or even if you just like music or you're interested in a good story because as I was telling Alan when before we watched this you don't have to like the music for NWA to enjoy this movie I I feel I feel like you have you don't even have to really like rap much you just have to kind of respect the art and kind of take it in as its own thing um do you feel that way definitely definitely I think um there's a lot in for it. Like, I, I think I enjoyed it because I've, I've got a bit of a, not as much as you, but a bit, bit of a genuine interest in, in hip hop. But I think even if I didn't have that, um, it's still an enjoyable story. And I think even if you're not a musician, if you just like, as you say, kind of, you're, in for, you're interested in a good story, you have a bit of interest in music and 
how the world was in the early 90s and 80s in terms of um, uh, music and kind of how it progressed, I think you're in for a good watch. I think it um, you don't have to really be into it to like it. Uh, it's definitely something that you could enjoy no matter where you come from, I think. I think even it was... Like biopics in general, like not even necessarily music one. Yeah, I think it really helps as well that they included so much real world history and actual real footage. Like they actually put in real news broadcasts. They put in the real footage of Rodney King being beaten by the police, the court trial. They, um, you know, dive into the history of like that, the riot, the LA riots, um, which happened because of the Rodney King out the verdict on the trial. So I think that like, if you like history and you want to know a little bit more about sort of like the seedy Compton LA and, you know, Watts area and all the sort of, you know, heavily African American, uh, sort of neighborhoods that are notorious for being pretty rough and stuff. I think it, I think there's so many elements that can draw people in from everywhere. It's either music a good story, the setting, uh, the history in it, uh, the era. There's like so many things that this movie has going for it and not many negatives, I feel. Definitely. Um, there's one negative I do have to bring up and that's the director's cut. Um, I bought the Blu-ray and the only reason I bought the Blu-ray was for the director's cut. Now, the director's cut, I'm not sure because it's really weird. I thought that the original theatrical cut that we watched was... Much shorter. I thought it was like an hour and 50 minutes. Um, the director's cut, I felt like, was the two hour and 26 minute one or whatever we said it was. But yeah. when we went to watch it yesterday, I was like, oh, okay, well, that's weird. I wonder what, how long the director's cut goes for because that's a long-ass movie just on its own, you know? Um, so I would suggest if anyone is wanting to watch it, um, watch the original cut because I feel like the pace keeps get going better. I feel like it's a lot tighter. And I'm not sure exactly what they added. I'm just going to quickly look up how much longer the runtime is. Compton, director's cut. Okay, so the director's cut. Uh, by the way, this movie grossed a box office of $201 million. <laughs> That's quite a lot of money for a movie like this. Yeah, you wouldn't, wouldn't think it would do that well. Yeah. So, okay, here we go. The director's cut... The director's cut... Uh, this is from the uh, director. It's a quote. Well, of course, the director's cut, it's in the title. It's the director's cut. There's more Compton, more controversy, more danger, more music, more relationships, more... Not, um, whatever, that's spelt wrong. It's more of the original uh, vision. I think both are really, really good, but if I were to pick, of course, the director's cut... Um, I mean, yeah, just trying to find like how much longer it is, but yeah, anyway, it's a, it, it just doesn't feel as tight, clean, um, as the original cut. So I suggest if you haven't seen it, go check it out. Uh, check out the normal one. It's actually on Netflix right now. Um, okay, so here we go. This is this is an invasion. Uh, director cut. Uh, director uh, Gary F. Gray says uh, original movie was meant was three uh, over three hours long they cut it to 226 uh sorry an hour uh two hours and 26 minutes and then they said that the director's cut runs about two hours and 46 minutes with an additional about a si additional 16 minutes added and that might not seem like a lot and if you really want to just see the whole lot for what it is then maybe check out the director's cut. But if you, I, th I just feel like this this cut is a lot cleaner and smoother. Um, did you think it really needed to go much longer? Do you think it was too short? What's your opinion on that? I think the only thing um, that could have had a bit more time spent on it, it, it five minutes if that, um, just a conversation, as you said, was uh, when it kind of changed from being Easy E to being NWA. I think that's the only thing that needed a little bit more elaboration because it just kind of jumps. But other than that, I, it it's pretty smooth flowing and complete. Uh, I can 
don't didn't really feel a need to know much more or see much more elsewhere. Like I think it, as you said, it's pretty self contained with the theatrical cut. Yep. And um, yeah, I'll bring up a couple more little facts to discuss. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask is, what do you think about the whole? Like you, you shared an interesting fact with me about Jerry Heller yesterday. Um, I don't know if you want to talk a little yeah. bit about that too. Yeah, um, I was looking into it, and he actually passed away in 2016. He had a heart attack while driving. But the interesting thing was, apparently, well, it was suspected that the cause of that was the stress from how this movie depicted him. Apparently, it put a lot of pressure and stress on him, and that led to his eventual demise, which it's sad, but at the same time, it's kind of like, well, you did these things. <laughs> but I also found that It's really hard, though, man, because, like, as much as he was doing the wrong thing, at the same time, there were moments where you really liked him because he had their back. He championed Definitely. them. He helped them get where they were. And, yeah, I know he owed them some money. And, yeah, I know that things weren't, like, he hadn't been straight up with a lot of them. But you saw how much money they made. In it. Like, you saw their houses. You saw their cars. You saw the lives they were living. I mean... It wasn't like he didn't do nothing for them. You know what I mean? I yeah. feel like I feel like while he did screw them over in the end, apparently there's, there's, that's another thing of um, sort of debate is how much truth there is behind how much he did wrong. Um, but you know, he did end up working with uh, Easy a lot. Like, they didn't they didn't show a lot, but it, like you know, they managed that company. They signed Bone Thugs and Harmony, who are huge. They uh, signed. Um, an all-girl rap group. I can't remember who they what, what their name is. Um, that's on that Defiant Ones documentary, if anyone wants to check that out. Um, he actually didn't have a lot... Like, he did a lot for other artists and towards, like, the end of his career before he died and before he was getting NWA back together and stuff. Apparently, he released a lot of bomb things, like, terrible things. Like, I think he did, like, a Christmas song, <laughs> which is really weird. Um, the other interesting thing is... That um, apparently Easy E um, and Dr. Dre had more than a beef just that, like than what we saw. Like um, I don't know if you've ever heard the song from Easy E. If you haven't, go check it out, Alan. It's called Easy uh, it's Real Motherfucking Jeeves, and that whole song is just a diss on Dr. Dre. Um, okay. It says, you know. Uh, I'll bring the video up quickly and I'll, I'll share it. Uh, it's uh, in the first lines. It's actually uh, pretty funny, but um, he has some good he has some good stingers. Uh, one second, but um, yeah, I mean, has this made you? As I wanted to know before, has this made you like want to check out a bit more of their music? Has this made you want to, um, you know, sort of maybe learn a little bit more because I. It personally, the movie tells you the way it goes really well and gets you into what it is, but there is so much more and so much more juicier shit too, like about Suge Knight. Um, actually, that's an interesting fact too. Suge Knight rocked up to the shooting of this movie uh, yeah. with someone um, and wanted demanding money, demanding to see Dr. Dre, said he didn't want his like that was being used. Security ushered him off. Uh, there was a gun pulled. Suge Knight took off as quick as he could and accidentally ran over his own friend and killed him. And now oh, Shug Knight, wow. and now Shug Knight is in jail for, I think he's going to be in there till he's 70 something before he'll get released because he ran over, and he's a dude named Bone. He's a gangster from Compton. So they shot in Compton um, on the actual places they wanted to shoot. And yeah, he rocked up feeling like it was his business to rock up to the set and yeah, accidentally ran over one of his friends, which We'll show that footage shortly, and I'll bring it up as well to just show you because there is actual footage of it, and it was on um, TMZ and everything like that. So um, that's pretty full on. Um, what did you feel? As, what did you feel about Suge Knight? Um, I think. Uh, one sec. Why? Sorry, Sorry about it, man. I don't know what, what dogs are like. Um, I. I've I've kind of I haven't read too deep into it, but having a bit of a flick through, kind of between watching it and now, um, I'm, I'm interested to look in more because it looks like, especially around Sugar Knight, there's a lot of shady stuff. Like Sugar Knight is one dude who has got a notorious fucking 
uh, sort of, you know, way people look at him and no one is a fan of Suge Knight. Um, I mean, have you heard of the YouTube channel DJ Vlad? I have not, no. It's a hip-hop channel. He does exclusive interviews, um, has everyone on. I mean, he's had... Oh, who, who's he had on? He's had Ja Rule. Um, like, he had the biggest stars you can think of in rap. And um, he said that even if he had a chance to talk to Suge Knight in an interview, he wouldn't do it because he wants nothing to do with him because nothing but trouble follows Suge Knight around. So um, I'm just going to quickly bring this up. I feel like that shows you a little bit more how deep the beef was than the movie kind of portrays it because, like, they really fucking hated each other. Um, and I don't know if you know much about Suge Knight as well. Like, he was Death Row Records, obviously, signed Tupac. Yeah. He signed Tupac. Um, Tupac was already big. He was already famous. He was already a rapper. He got put in jail for sexual, mis uh, sexual assault charges. Um, and... To get out of jail, he needed someone to pay bond. I think it was like two million bond or a million bond. And no one would put the money up, even his record label at the time. And Suge Knight saw that as an opportunity and walked into the prison, sat down with him and said, you want to get out? Signed to Death Row Records uh, and I'll pay for you to get out. And that's exactly what he did. So he signed Tupac. <laughs> Tupac recorded, we had like a four record deal or something with him. He knocked those four records out, I think in the space of a month or something like that. Like, apparently Tupac could record, like, three, four, five, six songs a day. He's that Jeez. good. So he was just that driven that he'd be like, I'm going to the studio, I'm going to do these albums. So he did, like, all the albums at one go and was like, I don't owe you shit now. Just put them out as you want kind of thing. And then he was the, obviously in the car when Tupac was shot and murdered and Suge was shot in the process in the head as well. Um, and it's not confirmed, but, uh, that was, that kill, I don't know if you know this, it's kind of been solved, um, the Tupac murder, it's not officially solved, but everyone knows who the fuck did it, which was, uh, a yeah. crip from Compton, whose name is Orlando Anderson, he, uh, got into the altercation with Tupac on the night of his death at the MGM Grand, which is on video surveillance, where they kicked his ass on camera and then left. And he basically went back to his cousins and stuff named Keefe D, who um, a big time Compton Crips. And they were like, well, let's go get this motherfucker. They had guns. That was how he, Tupac got shot, man. Was like, it was like Everyone was like, it's a big conspiracy, blah, blah, blah. No, nah, man, it was Tupac kicked someone's ass that night. And they came yeah. back and retaliated, man. And that was how it happened. So Suge Knight was a big part in this whole rap thing as well, but never for the right reasons. Um, yeah. He kind of looked at as kind of a monster. But also, I've also heard people say that if you're a friend of his, if you're decent with him, if you he likes you, he's the sweetest dude ever. But yeah. he's also very fucking quick to anger. And I'm glad that Dre did uh, leave uh, Death Row and do his own thing. And I think it takes a big person like to say, keep the money, walk away, 
I don't care. I don't want your masters. I don't want you. Get, you own everything. You can still own my original album, The Chronic. Yeah. Um, actually, no. He shot The Chronic to Jimmy Iovine after that. So, like, yeah, he owned that. But you know, California Love, all those songs. That's all Death Row owned. You know, um, and he walked away from it. And when you think about it, Dre walked away from two big opportunities and started his own thing and rose up still and changed hip hop again with his releases, you know? So, um, you know, there's just so much history from that, the hip hop, Los Angeles, even New York, even on the East coast, um, you, there's so much connection with every rapper, every artist like Biggie and Tupac are connected. So what I was trying to get to the point of with, you know, uh, Suge Knight being in the car with Tupac and him getting shot was that, Suge was destroyed, devastated by that. Tupac was his best friend, um, biggest earned money maker, um, yeah. biggest hip hop star at the time. So it's not confirmed, but apparently Suge Knight may have paid someone to get Biggie and shoot Biggie dead um, as a retaliation for Tupac because P. Diddy had actually offered money up for Tupac's head and it was a million dollars to the Compton Crips and the Crips didn't do it because of that, but they did it because of the retaliation thing. And then they were like, rang up PD and we're like, yo, we're here to collect. And so Suge Knight was like, well, P Diddy, bad boy records, you took my best friend, my biggest earner. I'm going to take your best friend, your biggest earner. And that's apparently what the word on the street is. Everyone knows who shot Tupac, but no one still is really aware of, who actually shot Biggie and why, but that's the word on the street if that's what yeah. happened. So that's a pretty interesting thing. I'm going wow. to quickly bring up the, the CNN. This is a, a video from CNN. This is a two-and-a-half-minute news report on Suge Knight on the Straight Outta Compton set. So one second. I'm going to bring this up. I hate how you have to fucking pick your sharing screen bullshit every fucking time, man. Fuck it hell. All right. <laughs> there is some new and disturbing video that will impact the murder case against media mogul Suge Knight. The video obtained by TMZ shows the January 29th incident where Knight's truck apparently runs over the two men. The truck backs up, hits one man. Seconds later, uh, the truck comes back and runs over that man. We've had to, you know, digitize the video because it's very violent. And then it also runs over um, another. And one of the men ran uh, who were run over died. Knight says that for his part, he was trying to get away because he thought he was being ambushed and might actually be shot. Should Knight is expected back in court at 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time today and CNN's Paul for Cameron is at the courthouse in Los Angeles. Here with me, legal analyst Joey Jackson and Danny Savalas. Paul, first to you, what are we expecting? Because we're hearing now that uh, Should may have actually dismissed his attorney as thinking of representing himself. Is that accurate? Well, things change fast here in Los Angeles, actually. What happened is, is Knight has already appeared. Knight walked into the courtroom and he uh, basically uh, notified everybody that his new attorney is Matthew Fletcher from Long Beach. And then Matthew Fletcher came downstairs after this very, very quick proceeding, one in which a bail hearing was set for uh, the 20th or continued until then. And Fletcher got in front of this whole video issue. And Fletcher said repeatedly that this was a case where Suge Knight was lured to this hamburger stand and then was ambushed there. He said he caught by three men who were known gang members. Let's take a listen to what the new lawyer for Suge Knight had to say. Suge Knight can put his arm reverse, the gentleman hit, then he takes the easiest way out. He's not required to back out and reverse down the street. These guys were, my, my understanding of active gang members, there's clearly a gun was removed. Again, the new attorney for Suge Knight trying to get out in front of all this repeatedly, stating that 100%, he says that this video shows that Suge Knight was ambushed, clearly laying a defense out where Suge Knight is articulating that these men had plotted and schemed to attack him at that burger stand outside the courtroom, though. other. So, yeah, you get the idea. It, he, tends up, yeah. he tends to end up in very bad situations, and... Usually that means it's the person to blame because 
I mean, he should probably should have gone to the set of Compton. And to him, for him to say he, he was lured to a burger stand and ambushed, he was in the street where they were shooting the movie. Now, he wasn't ambushed by anyone. So, um, yeah, I mean, we're going to kind of close up with our thoughts now. Um, I'm going to just straight out say it. Out of five, this is a five for me. Yeah, yeah. I think, I yeah, I'll I'll put it there as well. It's it, with what it says how to do and 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 how it delivers it. I'll also give this. I'll say, I'll yeah, fuck it. I'll say a five as well because it really really solid movie. It's raised my interest in something that I might not have necessarily known that much about or even had that much interest in, um, which I think says a lot. And as you said, it's. It's interesting, genuinely interesting, even if you're not 100% into the, like, the whole uh, West Coast hip-hop scene. It's, um, it's a good starting point, and it's, it's really well done. Like, casting, the vibe, the acting, I'll give it a five as well, I reckon. Definitely, definitely. And I really do appreciate how much they gave time to the music of them as well, like, they didn't just show really quick snippets of them on stage. Like, you know, they showed quite a bit of, you know, like minutes of music, you know. Um, and I really appreciate that they did that and didn't just make it straight sort of soap opera-ish biopic. Like, they kind of made it feel like you were at the concert, you were there. Um, funny little trivia part two, all the concert scenes, the big arena scenes, they were all filmed in the same arena with the same crowd. Um, for every state that they were supposed to go into, so yeah, um, it was all done in the one area, the one, the, the one big thing. So that's pretty cool. Um, quick recommendations from me: um, if you have watched this movie or you are want to going to go watch this movie and then you like it and you want to learn more into it, some recommendations of other content you can go check out, which tells you a lot more. Um, there is the Death Row, the Death Row Chronicles which is on YouTube. You can watch it in full. There is The Defiant Ones, which is on Netflix. There is a great, one of my favorite documentaries. It's called Unsolved, The Murders of Tupac and Biggie. Now, I don't know. I think this might be on YouTube for free as well. Um, so go check it out because it's one of the most riveting uh, information-filled documentaries you will find on the investigation and the murders of Biggie and Tupac uh, by Greg Kading, who is the um, detective that tried to solve it, and he believed he had solved it, and he got a confession from someone who was in the car that shot Tupac and blah, blah, blah. So it's a really good documentary. That's called Murder Rap. Actually, it's called Murder Rap. That's right. Murder Rapped, the murders of Tupac and Biggie, which also, by the way, has a Netflix show based on the documentary called Unsolved, The Murders of Tupac and Biggie. And it is directed and produced and stuff by Greg Kading, the detective as well. So he was, you know, um, a big role in it. And yeah, I just, those are the sort of documentaries you don't got to go check out because there is so much more to this story that we didn't touch on, that the movie didn't touch on. And if you really want to get into the nitty gritty of the real shit that went down, I suggest you go check it out. Um, those, those are my recommendations. Also, if you want to learn about how uh, Suge Knight uh, stole the contract for Vanilla Ice's Ice Ice Baby and made him hand over all the royalties for that song, um, go check out some uh, interviews with Vanilla Ice. Just type in Vanilla Ice, Suge Knight. Uh, apparently, Suge Knight hung him over a balcony to get that... Um, to get that music rights off him. So he hung him off a hotel balcony, apparently, which... Wow. Vanilla Ice apparently says didn't happen, but everyone else that was there says that Suge Knight walked in and said, we want that, we want those fucking, we want that money, motherfucker. You know what I mean? So, um, <laughs> yeah, so basically Suge Knight was just a bully of the industry. And yeah, I think the guy that portrayed him did a really good job. But also I think he kind of played him too articulate because Suge Knight in real life is the most laid back gangster gangster. Like, you know, uh, Talked very, not a lot of, uh, I don't know, just not a lot of feel feel to what he has to say, you know? It's all sort of one note. So, yeah. Yeah, but uh, anyways, I really liked it. I'm glad you liked it, man. Um, I'm really glad you did because uh, it goes to show that, 
you don't have to really have much ref- reference or much knowledge or be into that as much to really enjoy the movie, which you're an example of, you know. Um, I, uh, I'm i more into the rap side of things and I've, I went through the whole Eminem phase and listened to nothing but rap for a while, then went back to rock and metal and stuff and now I like both of them and I like to infuse both of them. So, you know, I've kind of had an appreciation for this sort of stuff since like grade five or six. So... It's cool that me, someone who knows a lot and loves it and can watch doco after doco after doco or topics on this uh, and know a lot about it, and someone like you who isn't as – we kind of fall in the same position of how good this movie is, and that's about the best praise this movie could possibly get. So, Definitely. Cool. Well, I hope everyone enjoyed that. Uh, That was a, you know, sort of a – an information filled review, I guess. Um, and I do feel like, you know, we've said about all we can really say about the movie. Um, I would say don't show it to your kids. <laughs> That's about the only advice I could say. Um, give them a little while, let them grow up a little bit first, then let them watch it. Um, so anyway, this has been our special, uh, special episode, uh, on, uh, louder pop culture podcast about straight out of Compton. We thank you for joining us on this review. We hope you had fun listening to it. Um, this is uh, sponsored by Smooth Your Balls. My balls, your balls, who's ever balls. Uh, go get that, uh, go with that link. It's going to be in the description. Get 20% off and get that trimmer to your house ASAP to fix that fucking forest up. <laughs> and also, like and subscribe to our channel, please. It would help us a lot. Um, share it. And also come across and like our Facebook page because that will keep you up to date more with when we are releasing things and uh, more information than you will get just by our YouTube because really all you can get from our YouTube is when we release something, you see that it's up. Whereas if you've got our Facebook page, you can follow when those things will be put up, what's coming up. Um, Next week, I believe it's coming up. We're still a little away. Uh, 11 days away, our review for Scream 5 will be up, Scream 2022, whatever you'd like to call it. We will be trying to get it up as quick as possible, hopefully one of the first up as we are in Australia and we get to see it sort of a little bit before America, get it. Hopefully we can get it up before then. Uh, We're going to have to work out the spoiler thing, but we'll work that out. And yeah, we hope everyone's doing well. Happy New Year. Happy 2022. Let's hope this COVID shit fucks off. And... Thanks for joining us. Absolutely. Have a good one, guys.